Welcome to Markers and Milestones, where we explore educational opportunities for young men and women beyond traditional college, all from a Christ-centered perspective. I'm Lee Bordens, and I'm with my co-host, Amanda Kleist. Today is Wednesday, January 31st, 2024, and today we're joined by Veronica Karaman, a professional golfer as well as life coach and just a really interesting person. You've done so many things uh, with your, your enjoyment of education and athletics, and so I was hoping, Veronica, that because our store, our podcast is Markers and Milestones, and obviously there's lots of homeschool um, young folks who would like to get involved in athletics. So if you could maybe tell them your story and how that all happened and the things that you recommend they do just in general, and then we can get to specifically what your ministry is and how you can help people. Sure. Well, I am a golfer, a professional golfer, and my story actually began when my father placed a putter in my hand at age five, and um, that kind of sparked my love for the game and he was a weekend player and um, he'd go play for four hours and I'd go putt for four hours straight. We belonged to a fraternal organization back then called the Greek Catholic Union. I I grew up Catholic and um, it would be my summertime passion to go in these national putting contests that this organization put on as we arranged our summer vacations um, around that Um, event. And when I got to be 14, I was too old for the age bracket to putt anymore. So the only way I could continue to putt was take up the whole game of golf. And so I actually putted before I took up the whole game. And um, I had a a very tragic moment when I was 15. Uh, My father came down with an unexpected bout with cancer and died nine months later. And I only got to play golf like nine holes with him. And so it was all during this love of the game that my father had as a weekend player that he instilled in me. And I so much wanted to play golf with daddy. Um, And when he passed, I think that's really what started my hunger and thirst for the Lord with that vacuum. Played on the boys team in high school. That was back before they had girls teams. And it was the very beginning of Title IX. I was the first girl from my high school to get an athletic scholarship to college. And I played for Duke University. And it was interesting because as I look back on my journey, like I could see the hand of God in it. Like I can remember um, getting a call, three calls from the athletic director from Duke University wanting to recruit me and I turned him down three times. I didn't even know what Duke was. I thought it was short for Duquesne University. <laughs> and I, I did, I didn't know I, I, I didn't know what Duke was. And so um, I said, my father died recently. I'm not going to, you know, leave my mom home alone. And finally the fourth time he called and he was like, look, let me just send you an application. And it was even after the, like the applications were due. And I said, well, I'm graduating early from high school and I'm going to go to Florida with my cousin and I'll stop at the school on my way back in North Carolina. And I did. And of course I realized what a, what a fool I was uh, to refuse that first phone call when my eyes were open and they offered me a full scholarship. But the story goes on from there, but I would say probably the greatest learning point that I have. And I tell young people all the time, I didn't know that I was paying for my college education while I was in high school Mm. by being an excellent student academically and athletically. Like I didn't know that just the pursuit of excellence was earning me a college scholarship. And as as a coach of a lot of young people now, I'll say to them, particularly in their junior and senior year, and these are bright students. These are students from good homes. These are students that, you know, excel. But I said, have you ever gone full court press with anything in your life? And I'm amazed at how many, particularly of the the teenage boys that I coach, will just honestly say, no. And I'll say, well, what would happen 
if you gave everything you had to the pursuit of your academics and your athletics, don't you think God would open up a door of opportunity for you that otherwise wouldn't have been opened? And um, I share that story in those beginnings because I don't think young people realize how much they can position themselves and create a trajectory for their future that is higher than what they would settle for. Well, I think that's really interesting. The one that we'll talk about that later, paying for college and high school. But you made me remember or remind me about how many young people I meet. I say they're legends in their own mind. They think they're far better and have worked far harder than they really have. And then you meet somebody that really does what you did. And you see the difference. So I have a question though. You putted, you know, we're classicalists. To us, everything is about the fundamentals. Do you think those putting competitions really set you up well for what you did? Well, you know the phrase, you 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 drive for drive for show and putt for dough. <laughs> and you know, back in the like back in the day, like now everything's about um these technical skills and all of this high technology. But back in the day, it was the putting green and me. And so I always say that it was about a relationship. Like I wouldn't get off that green until I knew the green and the green knew me. <laughs> and so often, you know, with the competitive golfers that I work with, they're like, well, I didn't putt well today. And I said, well, you know what that is? That's a lack of preparation. You think you go putt for 30 minutes and you know the greens? I don't think so. So I would always stay there and get a what's called a feel for the greens. And it was a very different approach. It was a it was a, a relational approach. And and being a girl, very much, and I'm just gonna say this, golf is still a man's world. I don't care what anybody says. And I'm so glad to see it much more inclusive. But I was, you know, a lot alone. And I had to figure out a lot of things by myself, but I had a love for the game. And so that love for the game created a work ethic. And I often say to people, there's two distinguishing features of a champion, superior focus and superior passion. So a lot of these kids have a, you know, a great passion, but there's really not the focus, you know, that goes along uh, with that. And what I call owning your own game and spending time by yourself just figure some things out. That's great. Okay, Amanda, what questions do you have? Oh, well, uh, nice to meet you, Veronica. Nice I know that you've too. met Lee before. Uh, it's interesting that you talk about uh, doing something in high school to pay for college. Actually, um, my daughter, um, somebody said, hey, you should go play golf because that's where the scholarships are. Um, she ended up playing water polo because she doesn't like to be hot. And I live in California. So um, she chose a different sport. And, and it, so she had no passion for the sport, even though the pragmatics look pretty good yeah. on it. Yeah. So my question for you is, can you teach feeling the green? And the reason I'm asking that is you've just said it's a differentiating factor, but it sounds almost like an intuition. It's, it's both. And it's really an excellent question. And and by the way, I'm the founder of True Champion Academy. And so I do performance coaching. And while I have a background in golf, my passion is really to teach people how to perform um, and excel. And, and, and here's what I've learned. Like when you go to the driving range and like you're working on technique, like and you're thinking about swing mechanics, that's very much left brain. That's very much thinking logistically relaxed. Uh, rationally, this is what I have to do. When you get on the putting green and let's say you go play golf, golf is not played from the left brain. Golf is played, as I would assume sports are, from the right brain. Right brain is envisioning, feeling, sensing. And so you have to learn the technique enough to kind of forget about it so that it can be automatic. And, and a lot of times nowadays, because of technology and everything, I see players staying in their left brain. And the easiest way I've found to help someone putting 
that needs to get into the right frame. As I'll say, I want you to pout with your eyes closed, right? So all of a sudden now, you can't think, you have to what? You have to feel. And the knowing has to be in your body. Like, like what is your body sensing of how much force you have to put into it? And I also find a lot of players just focus on distance, putting is distance and direction. Well, so they put tees down and they'll go from three feet, six feet, 12 feet, which is still very mechanical. But guess what? When you're out on the golf course and you got different undulations and different slopes, you have to have a feel and a knowing for curvature, like for breaks. And so a lot of these players don't teach how green, you know, or get the feeling of how much something breaks. So I'll say, don't just put the tees down, get a three to four foot putt, the biggest break right to left, left to right, and go put 25 in a row. So now your body has to have a feeling or a uh, perspective of how your body aligns to a target, right? Because some things will break more or less than what your eye perceives. So I always know I'll have a competitive advantage. Like last year, I followed, I made first alternate to the senior women's US Open, my first competitive round in a year. I played one practice round, but the day before I spent hours on the putting green because I knew if I could have a certainty of the feel of the greens, then I would have an advantage of someone that just showed up and putted for 20 minutes. And that's kind of what happened. So I think, I, I think that many times we underestimate what it takes to have a certainty about um, the greens so that we can have confidence just to play from our right brain. That reminds me of, um, cause my Robert played uh, basketball for eight days a week all through school. And uh, Hal, it's the same thing. He, he, he needs to not be worrying about his dribbling when he's playing. He needs to know the field so well and his team so well that the mechanics disappear. And I can see academically an analogy too. Those of us who are voracious readers, we don't see the words. We go yeah. right through them so fast yeah. because we're so yeah. used to them. We intuit yeah. that and know the context so very well. So I really appreciate the, the application to golf, which is probably the hardest sport that there is. It is. And I and I and and this is a very interesting thing too. And in many ways, I think it's the most spiritual game. And I'll even say this, it's the game where the, where the devil enters in the most. <laughs> because, it's, because it's individual and the perfectionist performance orientation of I am my score. Like, like you hit a bad shot and here's what players will say, excuse my French, I suck. You know what I'm saying? Like that's like the most uh, common kind of response. And I'm like, no, you don't. You had a bad shot. You're not a bad person. Mm -hmm. So golf, golf is the most challenging game to separate your the meaning that we attach to things. And, and that takes some emotional mastery. And if you can truly tap into who you are in Christ, and this is what set me free, because I, I actually had to quit the game for five years because it almost destroyed me. And God kept bringing me back to it. And I'm like, what's this about? You know, and I saw, I didn't think I could be a genuine Christian and play golf because of, of that struggle. And I saw, no, God was a little less religious than I was. <laughs> he just wanted me to be free to play the game. And so I, I, I have this concept called total victory, victory and winning and victory and defeat. Because as a child of God, I am loved unconditionally, no matter what. So that sets me free to succeed. It sets me free to fail. I'm the same person, regardless of my performance. And that's the beauty of truly entering into who we are in Christ. And really, the, the, 
what Jesus died on a cross to create that new creature that, um, that I have worth, my worth has nothing to do with my score. And, and that's a passion in my life to help instill this reality of the gospel as it applies to athletics and Christian athletes. And I think a lot of our discipleship of a Christian athlete is character-based, which is of course, totally valid. And, you know, you have integrity, you, you're you honest, you have good sportsmanship, but my bent is to help athletes enter into the freedom that we have in Christ to go all out and do it from a place of victory, regardless of the score. And if you can get a teenager, because a lot, you know, teenagers, the, the maturity of emotions is a little bit later in life. It comes, but I say a champion is someone that can get to a paradigm earlier than others. Hmm. So if I can train a young person, one, to become aware of their emotions, two, to understand how their thoughts create their emotions, and three, how their identity fuels their thinking and wire that because the beauty of working with the teenagers, their minds have yet to be really formed and instill that operating system in them, then they then they are set for life. And I, and I call that the surrendered athlete. You know, I'm going to make another analogy because of the audience that we have. All those things you said, you're just so smart about and you're so wise. You know, what people know that um, it's not just sports. So for instance, usually when children struggle academically, there's an emotional block. Like they think they're dumb or they can't do it or it's too unfamiliar and helping them control those emotions and know when to vent them and not vent them. It, it makes um, homeschooling so much easier. So I appreciate that you've uh, offered that. I want to hear more about your academy so that our families can know what they could do to maybe work with you. But before that, Amanda, do you have some questions for her? Yeah, so uh, you have just glowed when you talked about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to hear how you met him. I met the Lord in room 212 of the Pinecrest Inn in Pinehurst, North Carolina. And uh, the Pinecrest Inn is this traditional old inn that many, many years ago used to be like the social spot in town. And people would come from all over the world and sit outside on the porch. And it was a place where you can meet strangers like from all over the world. And um, when my father died, I, you know, and I went to Duke. I would spend my summers in Pinehurst and the owner in the at the inn at the time was uh, named Bob Barrett. And Bob became an adopted father of mine and I would spend my summers there. And it was the junior, it was the summer of my junior year. And um, I was in a relationship that I knew that didn't honor the Lord. I found out that my favorite Catholic priest was in an illicit affair. And I was completely disillusioned. I was probably the lowest point in my life. And I went into a Christian bookstore in Southern Pines and I bought 10 books. I have never been in a Christian bookstore in my life. And to this day, I cannot remember what one of the books was. But it was the first time in my life I started reading the scriptures myself. Mm -hmm. And it was two o'clock in the morning, room 212 of the Pinecrest Den, where I finally had a revelation of salvation, that Jesus died on a cross for me, that he took all my sins, my sin nature upon himself. It was a gift. And all I said was, Jesus, I need you from my heart. Went to bed, woke up the next morning, and I just had this joy in my heart, you know, and all the pain and heartache and disillusionment from all of that was gone. It really was like an emotional miracle. And I ran downstairs to the hotel manager, Mr. B, and I grabbed his arm and I said, Mr. B, Mr. B, I've overcome. And he looked at me like I was on drugs or something. I said, I've invited Jesus into my life. And he was like, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> and that began the story. And, and what was most amazing, you know, God hears your prayers. 
And sometimes those prayers go over a lifetime. Because I prayed for 10 years. I said, God, would you be my father? How will I know that you love me? And I was talking practical as a young person. Mm -hmm. If I don't know that you care about what I care about. Mm -hmm. So if you'd enter my golf game and walk down the fairways with me in the absence of my earthly father, that'd be really cool. And little did I know that God answered that prayer over a lifetime. And there was a moment when I got really sick with chronic fatigue out on the golf tour. It was 1988. And I landed in a town called Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Didn't know a soul. I almost collapsed on the golf course. I saw two balls instead of one. Five doctors later, they diagnosed me with what we now know to be chronic fatigue syndrome. These strangers took me in. I stayed with them for like six months. I couldn't lift my head off a pillow. Mm. And I prayed. And I was like, now what do I do? And all I kept hearing was this little voice whisper in my ear, just do it. <laughs> just go for it. And I was like, go for what? I'm like, and the only thing I could really go for that year was the U.S. Open. Because you didn't have to qualify for a tour or do anything like that. You just play in a qualifying tournament. And I remember just asking myself, like, what voice am I going to listen to? And I always tell people we have three voices, actually four, talking to us all the time. Like the critic, you know, that puts us down and tells us why we can't do something. Like the coach that opens up our mind to a new possibility. And the champion voice that says, I can, I will, I believe. And then the voice of the Lord, which I believe informs that champion voice. So I said, I'm going to listen to my champion voice because I'm going to fight. And with that, I got up out of bed. I said, I'm going to go find the biggest hill I can find, which is pretty hard in Tulsa because I think Tulsa is kind of flat. <laughs> but I found a hill. I climbed the hill. Within a few months, I was jogging. I go down to the U.S. Open qualifier. And it's, ama it's an amazing story. And I... I put it in the in the book, God Make Me a Champion. Um, I end up shooting 71. I win the US Open qualifier and I'm off to the US Open. Six months, six That's months amazing. later by listening to the voice of God. And what was so amazing was that, you know, we know God when we're in the gutter, but he's also the most high God. Mm -hmm. And my heavenly father took me all the way to the U.S. Open to show me his love for me, to set me free to play the game I, I, where it was just a game and I had joy. I got to, I took testimony tracks and handed them out to everybody that lived, moved, and breathed. And it was an amazing victory of faith and of, of really experiencing uh, the father's love uh, in a peak performance. Nice. Well, that's a treasure that you just shared with us when you share a testimony. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. He's just so faithful and he's always fun too. I mean, that was a very interesting story. Okay. So you have a number of books and academy and your coaching ministry and all those kind of things. So why don't you spend uh, the next five minutes or so telling us about um, what you are just most passionate about that you want our audience to be to participate in? Well, currently, I actually I have an online academy, which I call True Champion Academy. It's truechampionacademy.com. And on that, I I've created a 12 module video series called The Champion's Way. And I'm going to grab this for a second. Sure. But um and I also have a book. It's the same. It's a system. It's a holistic system for peak performance. And in it, I show people how to create peak performance by becoming fully engaged in the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual dimensions of performance. So this is a, a framework of thought. I use this for all my students, all my clients. And it, instead of just being one lane, 
you know, shows you the, the full lane of the skill set, mindset, belief set that you have to have to perform. And um, more recently, this is the book I wrote. I have the U.S. Open story in here, and it's called God Make Me a Champion, An Athlete's Journey of Faith into the Power of Surrender. So this is the system. This is the faith dimension that goes with the system. And in God Make Me a Champion, I chronicle my story because I know faith is inspired by story. And I share the in-depth coaching journeys of other athletes that I've trained. And people are inspired by this because they see the in like the nitty-gritty of the inner workings of how you can want to win a championship and the steps to get there. And then probably the one that's given me the most joy um, is this book I wrote called My Shot of Joy. The Miraculous Journey of Redeeming a Lost Mother-Daughter Relationship. And this is my mom and me here. She looks just like Betty White, if you can, <laughs> if you can see that. But this is an amazing story because when my mom was 85 years old, she was given six months to live with a terminal heart condition. We were emotionally estranged my whole life. She had to quit school in the fifth grade in the depression to earn a living. And, you know, when my father died, like I prayed for 25 years, Lord, don't take my mom until I know her. Cause I couldn't bear the thought of not knowing at least one of my parents really well. So when she was given that death sentence at 85 and given six months to live, I knew it was my time to reach her. So I laid everything down and it was a whole different kind of championship. You know, this was, I'm going to, I said, I'm going to reach your heart before you die. I don't care what it costs, what it takes, mm -hmm. how it's going to happen. But I'm going to reach your heart. And she was very crusty, you know, had a lot of walls, bought her dog, bought her cat, took her old folks homes, but everybody was too old for Mildred. So finally one day out of exasperation, I just said, mom, that's it. I've had it. Put your tennis shoes on. We're going to golf course. So I hand this little old woman an eight iron. <laughs> He takes a waggle. I was like, nah, where do you get that waggle? I don't waggle the club. She goes, oh, that's how Tiger Woods does it. I said, watching too much Tiger Woods. So she takes a big old backswing, swings down, and pops that sucker almost 100 yards on her first try. I said, ma, I thought I got it from dad. Like 40 years later, I got it from you. So by the third ball, my mother looked at me with fresh fire in her eyes and she goes, put another ball down. Mm -hmm. I started my mother's golf career at 85. We had a perfect friendship on the golf course. At 88, I helped her start a house cleaning business. She had her first paid modeling shoot. At 89, she started public speaking. At 90, I entered her into her first golf tournament, the Grandma Open, brought together the generations. And uh, at 91, that woman died my best friend. And it was an amazing story of how the use of gifts and talents have an energy in them. And I was trying to help her to die well. And God was saying, no, help her to live well. And this woman was literally blossoming while she was dying. And it just goes to show the power of love, the power of coaching, the power of asking God for wisdom in the journey that I saw the champion come out in my mother that I never would have seen had we not gone there. And the game of golf brought so much of that out of her because golf is a space where you got you you have your own swing. You have to be responsible for yourself. And you're looking out, you're not looking at one another, you're looking out at a target in the same direction. So it kind of puts you in a proper alignment, just being in the game. And I often say golf is such a great sport because it's social, it's competitive, and it's personal growth. Like it's all three of those. So while my journey started competitively, it so much ended on that, it hasn't ended yet, but 
towards the end, that social piece where I got to connect with my mom and know her and have some beautiful stories from that experience. So great. Can you tell us your website and or where we can buy those books? Um, you can get any of the books on Amazon. And the website, again, is truechampionacademy.com. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I recently, by the way, um, expanded my training to um, coaches, athletic directors, and team sports. I just um, did a training for a Christian high school in Alabama with the athletic director, who was also the coach of the girls' volleyball team. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. And I'm getting ready to do a training uh, with the Charlotte Eagles girls middle school um, soccer team in a couple of weeks. And so I'm excited to take the principles and the mindsets and the inspiration um, to a broader context in sports. And if anybody's interested in my coming to their school or whatever, I would uh, love to connect with them. I do a lot of work by Zoom. I'm going to Florida in for the whole month of March. And um, if there's anybody, you know, in the Florida area whatsoever, I would be delighted to come uh, speak to your school, your athletes. In Florida in March. If, any other questions, Amanda? Yeah, this is a one about the lifestyle. Um, you've given us a lot of positive and a lot of spin, positive spin, not that any of it's false, but um, living a lifestyle where you play games on weekends, travel, live in hotels, uh, that kind of thing. How do you maintain your relationship with the church while living that type of lifestyle? Or what things could you say, don't do it like I did or do do it like I did? Both. Um, first of all, you don't play on the weekends. You play, you play all the time, except maybe okay. when you're traveling. And I call it a miserable, wonderful experience. And it can be extremely lonely. Um, there, I led the girls' Bible study when I was out on tour. But I would often, I'll give you a great story. I was out playing in a tournament in Decatur, Illinois, and I was so lonely. I was just like, and I said, God, you know, I'm not going to go in a bar and meet a guy, but, but look, I need a hug. I need something because I'm dying. So I played in this tournament and I had two triple bogeys in a row. Now, I don't know if you play golf or not, but that's just like, Number one, one triple bogey is bad enough, but two in a row. So I missed the cut. And my cart driver at the time was a worship leader of this church. And he said, Veronica, why don't you come to church tomorrow? Since I wasn't playing golf, I was like, okay. So I drive down to downtown Decatur, Illinois, and I immediately saw that it wasn't the best part of town. And I went to look in um inside the building and I thought oh my I just realized that if I go in there I'm going to be the only white chick in the place <laughs> I said no he invited me I felt a little awkward but I'm like I'm I'm going to accept this invitation so I walked in I sat down and I was I was a little uncomfortable and I sat in the back way back in the in the sanctuary so it got to be um greeting time like beginning part of the service and the pastor goes I understand we have a visitor here today sister Veronica why don't you stand on up and share your testimony <laughs> I did and then when it came greeting time I think every person in that church gave me a hug Tall ones, short ones, old ones, young ones, fat ones, thin ones. I never got so many bear hugs in my life. And at the end of the sermon, uh, at the end of the service, the pastor goes, Sister Veronica, I understand you're a minister. Come on up here and close out the service. So, and they brought me up. I shared. I said, now, isn't this amazing that God would bring 
a single white professional golfer from Virginia Beach, Virginia to Decatur, Illinois, hear the cry of her heart for a hug, have me miss the cut, meet your worship leader, land in the middle of your Sunday uh, service to answer the cry of my heart. I said, I have received so much love from you today. And if, and if, if there's that much love for me coming halfway across the country, what could you do for your neighborhood? What if you took this love outside of this building and shared it with your community? Well, I'm, I'm sitting there exhorting them and encouraging them. I didn't know this till after the service, the church had gone through a church split. Mm -hmm. So God was sending me to this church, not just for me, but for them. Yeah. So then I'm leaving the church and the pastor goes, Sister Veronica, you come back next year, we'll have a revival and you can do the revival. <laughs> so I always made it a name to find a church wherever I was going and be part of that body um, and have some good uh, Christian friends but it's not easy. So you. So it sounds like um, there's not like the Fellowship of Christian Athletes for golfers or the USGA isn't promoting that or anything. Well, you you go into a town and you go in and you go out. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's nothing that is sitting there waiting for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's very transient. And mm -hmm. so um, one of the things I did do and I encourage my players to do is, is to break the thing open and make your journey relational. And I remember one time I was driving down the road and I said, God, I don't want to feel lonely in, in this pursuit. And God gave me the idea of starting a caddy club. And a caddy club is a prayer and encouragement club where you invite your friends on your road to championship with you. So I'm taking a very individual sport and I'm breaking it open to make it community oriented. And so what I did, I invited my friends. I said, listen, I am pursuing these championships. I'm traveling. I want to invite you into my online caddy club. So every Sunday I would send an email out to the people in my uh, email group of my caddy club I would tell them where I was at, what I did that week, what my victories were, say something inspiring to them, say what my my needs were. I would express my needs and I would invite them to respond. I cannot tell you how many people sent me an email that was exactly what I needed in the moment that I needed it. And I, and I can remember being on an airplane one day and I said, yeah, I started this caddy club and I'm doing this. And it was a total stranger next to me. And he goes, I want to be part of your caddy club. And it was like, people want to be uh, attached and aligned to people who are pursuing something by faith. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they're hungry. I had almost a hundred people in my caddy club. And Believers, non-believers, golfers, non-golfers, like I would inspire them. They would inspire me. And I think this is what's called like a higher purpose or a mission. And I think that brings wholeness to competitors that if you're doing what you're doing for a reason beyond yourself. And I told myself, regardless of how I play, I'm going to inspire people. I'm going to use this opportunity, which became my life mission to inspire champions, mm -hmm. because especially today in our culture, what do we need? We need a resurgence of spirit, right? Like, like, like we need to call people up and out and whether it's sharing the story of my mom, or I just taught a young man how to set and achieve goals and a great young man very athletic, came from a good family, but he didn't know how to set and achieve a goal. I said, well, 
you got to do that if you're going to go anywhere in life, right? Mm -hmm. And so I shared his story. And, and I had a four-time Olympian send me, love this story, keep it up. So then I said to him in a coaching said, do you know that you just inspired an Olympian? Yeah. Don't you think that's going to further motivate this champion in the making? Mm -hmm. But these are things that I learned along the way by seeking the Lord and, and saying, I want to, I want to be whole. And I I've discovered, you know, I've been doing this for like 40 years. It's not the pursuit of excellence that engenders greatness. It's the pursuit of wholeness. The soil of greatness is wholeness. Because I was so dysfunctional that, that I was trying to find my worth in a goal. It was outside of myself. So that means you're actually separating yourself from yourself. But wholeness, meaning I know I'm loved, I'm I have relationship, I I have a, a fullness of life. And that's what Jack Nicholas had. You know, he played all these different sports, his family supported him. He didn't even focus on golf till he was like 18. But but and then someone asked him later in life when he, you know, was retired from golf, he said, do you miss it? And he said, no. He said, I'm a competitor, essentially. And there's so many things that I can compete in. Business, mm -hmm. I can attend my grandkids' games. Like, that's wholeness. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Arnold Palmer, he said, was very depressed because golf was everything to him. Mm -hmm. So here are these two greatest in the games with very different um, states of being, one had wholeness and the other didn't. Yeah. And um, and these are the things that now I'm in, at this point in the trajectory of my journey, I can look back to a younger person and say, do it in such a way that you don't crash and burn like I did because I had no one, I, I didn't have a mentor. I had no one to help me see how to pursue greatness from a place of wholeness. And so performing from relationship, performing from love, that's, that's wholeness. And that's what my coaching practice is all about. So I can see that being helpful for so many different ways that young people develop markers and milestones. So if you're in like a traveling theater group or you're in the movie industry or the orchestra industry or you're military or you are um, part of an ambassadorship or something, there's all kinds of people who don't have stable geography that work in this world. And I think your caddy club and the coaching ideas you've given um, are just amazing, Veronica. And I hope that people buy your book and sign up for more of your coaching. It was really great to have you on. Amanda, we're pretty much out of time. Do you have any closing comments? Uh, Veronica, thanks for sharing your journey and also the markers and milestones of going back to relationships mm -hmm. and they're not about ending well, but about living well in the endings. That is a true marker and milestone. That's yeah, really great. Thank you great. so much. Thank you, team. I'll see you another time, Veronica. Thank you. Good to see Bye. you. Bye.